So that's right. We're going to be, we've been travelling through the book of Philippians, and this is our uh, our fourth and final week of that journey. And as we've said uh, previously, it was written by the apostle Paul from a Roman prison, and uh, this book helps us if we apply it to our life. It helps us meet the challenge of living for Christ no matter what is going on in our life. We are in a COVID season at the moment. That presents great difficulties uh, of a particular kind. But the church and God's people have always experienced difficulties throughout history, throughout the 2,000 years of the church. But no matter what is going on, God is with us to help us in that challenge, in those challenges. And just a brief recap, in chapter 1, we uh, looked at where Paul urges us to live in a way that testifies that God is the boss, God is in control, and to live in the light of that truth. It's one thing to say God is in control, it's another thing to live as if he is. But he certainly is, he's in charge of our lives, he's in charge of this world. So chapter 1 point us to that. In chapter 2, we saw that contrary to popular and secular opinion, that the way up is down. What is that? What do, we, what do we learn from that? The way up is down. We saw that Jesus perfectly embodied the example of a servant lifestyle and mindset. He gave us an example to follow. He showed us that the way up is to come down, to humble ourselves, to live a servant lifestyle. Then last week in chapter 3, we saw the Apostle Paul gave us his own personal example of how he learned what it means to live as a Christ follower, no matter what he was going through, good or bad. He, he showed us that in, in losing, we actually win. When we lose for Christ's sake, we win. We win. Paul encourages us in that chapter to place no confidence in the flesh, no confidence in our achievements or our possessions or even our place in the world, but to only trust in Jesus as true and lasting security. We saw again that our place in God is never earned, but only received by faith in the blood of Jesus, even as we just celebrate around the table, that that is the place of our value, our final worth. Not that the things that we have are valueless, not that the things you've done, the university course you've finished, the job you've got, the house that you've earned by your hard work, not to say those things lack value. Of course they have value, but their value does not compare to the value you have in knowing Christ and the value that God places on your life regardless of those things. Even if you had no learning, no achievements in the world, no possessions, no house, no car, no clothes that were, you know, pretty to wear, that God still values you regardless. And as, as we said, in the end, in the end, as followers of Christ, whatever we may lose in the process of following Christ, we are still all winners. Paul said, I count it all loss for the surpassing joy of knowing Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, as we come into this uh, final week of this book of Philippians, we pray you continue to minister to our our, our mind, spirit and our soul because, Lord, your word does all three. It comes right into our life and it, and it, it influences, inhabits our being. So, Lord, we pray that as we come to this final chapter that that will be our experience today that we will grow in you we'll know more of you that, and the lord will be energized and strengthened and encouraged by what we hear from your word today that there'll be no shame there'll be no put downs in your word today that we would receive but we'd only receive lord that you love us you value us and you have great things planned for every one of us and we believe these things and we hold on to these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm just going to quick little refresher. Amen. So as we head into this 
final chapter, chapter 4, um, we're going to examine a point that is often lost in the life of the church. I don't believe in this particular church that we have to labour the point. I think it's well grasped here in this church. But it revolves around the truth that we are never called to be Christ followers in isolation. We're never called to be Christ followers in isolation. We are called to be part of something important, something impactful, something that's bigger than us, and that's the church of Jesus Christ, his body. That's what we're called to be part of. God never said, oh, Wendy, I'm going to save you so you can be Wendy in the world, separated from every other believer, just Wendy, my representative, my Jesus follower in Ipswich. That was never God's calling on any one of us. We're all called to, be, to represent him as part of the body of Christ. Not to say we don't have an individual identity in that. Of course we do. Just like when a man and woman are married, the Bible says they're one, right? But does that mean that Josie and I have ceased to be individual persons? Of course not. We still exist as Josie and John and we're separate in our, in our likes and our dislikes and, our, 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 uh, and all the, the things we accomplish. But we are still, God says we are still a oneness in our marriage. And so it is in the church. We are one in Christ in this body of believers, but of course we, we continue to exist. John's still John who he is, and Alistair's still Alistair. We're all exist as that individual, but we're part of something bigger. And where I think sadly things go wrong often for Christian believers is they think that they can exist as a Christian outside of the church. Just me and Jesus, just me and Jesus. We just have such a glorious time. Just me and Jesus. It was never meant to be like that. You can have your me and Jesus time, that's fine. But you also have to embrace the body of Christ. Can I hear an amen? Yes. Amen. So it follows then from that, that one of the most effective ways of learning to live well, particularly in tough times, is experiencing a connected and open-hearted unity in Christ. Spirit-led and empowered relationship in the body of Christ. And I'm going to repeat that phrase often during this, this message, being connected and open-hearted unity in Christ. That's what Paul was trying to get across to the believers there in Philippi. God intends, we don't just show Christ our individual example, but as a witness, as a body of believers. So it's important to God what vision Christian family looks like to the outside looking in. Not just how they see Isabel or Alexa or Wendy or Karen or anyone else, but how do they see vision Christian family? God says that's important. God says that matters. And it matters, of course, for how the, the Ipswich community sees Catalyst and uh, the other churches, and the Lutheran church, and the Catholic church, and St. Paul's. You know, it's, it's the same. Whatever body we gather in, it's important to God how Ipswich sees him through those bodies of believers. It's the demonstration of us as a church. So let's look at some elements of this kind of united and open-hearted fellowship and then look at some next steps there. So first of all, I'm going to read a piece of scripture here, from verse 1 through to verse 9. You can follow along in your Bible or you can listen along with me. Paul says, Therefore, my brothers, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, that is how you should stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. I plead with Eudia and I plead with Syntyche to agree with each other in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, fellow yoke fellow, help these women who have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. So he's talking about a bunch of Christians here. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evidence to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, 
which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learnt or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice and the God of peace be with you. When we read a big passage of scripture like that, I think it should come to us that all those verses that we pull out come from somewhere. When we say rejoice in the Lord always, I'll say it again, rejoice. Now that's a great scripture to pull out and apply to everyday life. It's great. But remember, that belongs in a context. Belongs in a part of scripture that gives it added meaning. Gives it added meaning. Context always does that. And so often we can short uh, sell the Bible by, ta- by just taking a verse and saying, well, I'll just apply that. I don't know where it belongs. And I don't know what it means in context, but I'll just take it. And we can short sell the Bible. It's important to know why that passage is there. Why, is it, why did he say that? And what was the context of that? And that's why it's helpful to, to do the expository kind of message we're doing in this series so we can see that the Word of God always fits in a context. Always. Anyway, let's break that down a bit. That was all free. I, I don't, there's no charge for that. That was just pulled out of who knows where. But let's break this down a little. First of all, the thing he says is get along with each other. Very practical, isn't it? Get along with each other. Paul takes time in this teaching, this epistle to a church, he takes time to urge two women to get along better than they have been. It's like, he's, imagine he's writing to VCF and, uh, you know, he, he says, our Teresa and Karen, I want you to get along with each other. Stop fighting. How embarrassing, you know, this church, this letter comes from the Apostle Paul and he, we read, I've got to read this in church. By the way, he said, Teresa and Karen, you've got to get on with each other. It's important that we're in good relationship with each other. Of all the people in the world, God's people should learn how to get along with each other. Can I hear an amen? Of all the people in the world, look at the help we've got. The Holy Spirit lives in us. The world doesn't have that benefit, you know, that privilege yet till they receive Jesus. But we do. And yet so often, so often we don't take advantage of that. We've got so much in Christ that unifies us. So much. The body and blood of Jesus, we just celebrate together. So much that unifies us. Now, Paul is not talking here about being tolerant of falsehoods or bad doctrine. He's already addressed that in chapter 3. He's not just saying, get along and it doesn't matter what anyone says. We're not going to contend with them. We're not going to argue the point about anything. He doesn't say that. He's not talking about bad doctrine. He's not talking about those things. Um, we're called to stand firm on central doctrine. Now, no one's going to be allowed to come in here and say, oh, um, John, can I come and preach at your church? Sure, what are you going to preach about? Well, I found out that Jesus is just one of many gods and I'd like to share that with your church. Oh, good, well, I wouldn't want to have any contention, so of course you can come in and share about these other gods who are just like Jesus. Am I going to do that? Are we going to do that? No, of course not. That's to do with false doctrine and... and, and uh, that kind of thing. But we're not usually talking about false doctrine when we fight with one another. It's not usually about something like that. It's usually, in churches, sadly, in the past, it's been about the colour of the hymn books. There was a shameful situation in the States. I think, I won't even mention the denomination, it doesn't matter. The church could not agree on the colour of the hymn books. So, this is true. So I'm not making this up for effect. They took a chainsaw, chainsaw, and they sawed this timber church down the middle and half the red hymn book people took their half of the cut up church and transported to another location. And the red hymn book people got to stay in the old half. I sort of think of the church, the community around about that church. 
How many people think they looked on and went, well, hallelujah, thank God for the church of Jesus Christ. People really know what they want and they're prepared to stand for it and get what they really want. How many people thought the community looked on and thought that? How many people think the community looked on and thought, whatever's going on there, I want nothing to do with it. I don't believe there was a great um, evangelistic move that came out of that. It was a shame on the body of Christ because they weren't contending about a major doctrine. They were contending about something that they, they could have sorted. They could have sorted. I don't know what the mixture between green and red is. I think it's brown. Split the difference, have brown symbols. Anyway, get along with each other, the Bible says. Get along with each other. Sometimes biblical truth is used as a hammer to hit other people over the head. And sometimes people like me, leaders, are the worst. They're the worst at it. But any one of us can be. But we're not meant to, to, to use truth as a hammer. The pursuit of truth, as far as Christian things goes, is supposed to start and end with the glory of God above all. That's it. As we have that quote from St. Augustine. Uh, you probably didn't meet him. He was an early church father in the 4th and 5th century. But he said this, and it's come down through the years, in essentials, unity. We do unite around the blood of Jesus, around the uniqueness of Jesus, around the deity of Jesus. In non-essentials, Liberty. Non -assent. We, we allow people to have their opinion. When is Jesus coming back? Well, I think he's coming back next week. Well, I don't agree. I think he's coming back in 10 years' time or 100 years' time. On those matters, we have liberty. Okay, you're free to believe that. That's okay. We don't need to break fellowship because you think Jesus is coming back next week and I don't. Liberty in those things. And in all things, he said, love. In other words, he's saying, don't. Don't bash anybody for anything. Show love. Show love. We're going to be tolerant of diverse opinions. So where there's a, a conflict over doubtful things, well, the scripture tells us what to do. In Romans 14, 19, Paul says, let, let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Whatever we can. Colossians 3, 14 says a similar thing. And over all those virtues... Put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Paul is talking about us living as Christians in harmony as much as we can. And look, I'm not suggesting that sometimes that doesn't become difficult. I know it does. But our, our desire, our motivation should be towards harmony and not division. And notice that Paul doesn't just ask these two women to get along, but he asks other leaders in the church to help them. He says, you guys get alongside them and help them. Why? Because Christian unity in a, body of Christ, in a local body of believers is everyone's business. It's all of our business. We all have a stake in unity. If there's disunity breaks out in this church, it impacts every one of us. So when we see brothers and sisters not in, not in agreement, we shouldn't just shake our heads and just talk behind our hand at them. We should do what we can to help them get along. Sometimes all we can do is get people to agree to disagree, right? Sometimes it's, you know, when you're sitting down at the family barbecue, oh, you know, I'm all for Trump, no, I'm for Biden, and so on, there's big debates and discussions. So in the end, can we come to a definite decision about Biden or Trump? No, of course we can't. Some, all we can, best we can do is, okay, let's agree to disagree. All right, pass me another soft drink or something. Um, Sometimes we can just agree to disagree. That's fair enough. You know, sometimes it's our pride that says no. Sometimes, always our pride says, no, you must understand that I'm right and you must agree. Anyone else been motivated that way at any time in their life? When we've got children, of course, we are often motivated that way, aren't we? And for good reason sometimes, of course. The second principle of living in united and open-hearted fellowship is to rejoice in the Lord. You can see there's a context for it. And Paul's not just saying, hey, cheer up, cheer up. 
just smile through your pain. He's not saying that. You know, we can do that for a, a measure of time and there's some benefit in smiling through our pain, but it can't last. But rejoicing is something else altogether. Rejoicing is to do with joy and joy is the evidence of the Holy Spirit at work in a person or a group of people and joy goes beyond happiness. Paul and Silas could not have been happy as they're locked up in a rat-infested, damp prison. There's no way known. It would be psychologically ridiculous to say, Paul, are you happy? Oh, yes. Love these rats. The dampness is it's cool. And I'm not getting any food to eat. But boy, it's trimming down my old tummy. I'm so happy. That would be ridiculous. He wasn't happy, but he had joy. The difference between joy and happiness is not hard to understand. Happiness is a fleeting emotion. It's easy to be happy if I'm holding someone's hand who I like, if I see money in the bank, if my health is sound, I feel happy. That's a normal way for human beings to operate. But joy is different. Joy goes beyond happiness. Joy is an outworking of faith. Joy is an outworking of faith. It's the assurance, it's the confidence that God will do what is best in any situation, no matter what the immediate physical or worldly situation is at the moment. And that's why Paul could say, I've got joy. You know, he's sitting in his prison in his stocks and he's all locked up. And he says, "Not wow, this is great. Wish this would go on forever. But he had joy because he knew God was working in his situation. No matter what he could feel with his hands or feel with his feet, he knew God was still at work. Amen? And that's where joy comes from. It comes from that faith. And um, our joy ultimately rests in the Lord, of course, in the Lord Jesus. But there are things we can do to lift our faith and our joy level. We can read the Bible. We can read the Scriptures. We can listen to worship music. That's a great way. We can pray to the Lord and we can join in supportive fellowship. As we gather in this place, this is a means of God giving us joy. I don't know if you've thought of that before. That's one of the purposes of gathering together here on a Sunday and in groups and things is that God might impart joy through our fellowship together. It's a purpose of it. And I'm sure that you've experienced that. Thirdly, living in united and open hearted fellowship, <coughs> Paul says we need to receive God's peace or we can receive God's peace within Christian community. He says in verse 6 and 7, we all read it before but I'll say it again, don't be anxious about anything but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving present your request to God and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We all want the peace of God to rule in our hearts. There wouldn't be a person here who says, no, I don't want the peace of God. We want that. We want the peace of God to rule in our hearts and our minds and our spirit. But Paul there gives us a condition that will need to exist first before we experience that peace. And he says we need to deal with anxiety. Anxiety is pervading our culture and our community like never before. Anxiety is basically the fear of the future. And there's lots of reasons for people in the natural to fear the future. What if the vaccine doesn't work? What if we're locked down? What if 2024 is no different from 2020? That's a, that's a legitimate natural fear. There's no guarantees that this thing's going to go away. You, we all know that, don't we? There's a fear in the future that grips people. But anxiety, fear of the future, is the antithesis or opposite of faith. There's a difference between being fearful of the future and acknowledging a future that may come about, may not. There's a difference between fear and acknowledgement. There's a big difference. You can, there's nothing wrong with saying, oh, look, 
this vaccine may or may not work. We hope it does, but it may not. There's a possibility we may not be able to travel widely interstate or overseas for three or four years. The difference between that being a reality and making that a fear that grips our life and robs us of peace. It's a difference. Paul is telling us it's possible to live free of anxiety. And one, and one way of doing that is surrounding ourselves in a unified body believers you know worry and anxiety we've seen can take hold of an entire community we've seen it through coronavirus and yes we know that it's a deadly disease and not to be taken lightly but the anxiety and fear surrounding it have sometimes been blown out of all proportion would you agree with me on that do you remember people coming to fisticuffs over toilet paper do you remember that Anxiety and fear got such a grip of people that they, they roll on the floor in a supermarket fighting over toilet rolls. If we were to have said that in 2019, guess what's going to happen? You would have said, John, you're crazy. Nobody's going to roll on the floor fighting over a toilet roll. This is Australia, the land of plenty. You know? That's never going to happen. Well, we all saw it on TV and on YouTube. We know it did happen and it wasn't isolated, was it? We saw the streets, the, sh the, the shelves stripped bare like we're in some third world developing country. But it was Australia. It was Brisbane, it was Melbourne, it was Sydney. It's a lucky country. And we acted like some people acted like fear-driven rabbits. Didn't have to be. We had plenty of stuff, didn't we? We had plenty of stuff. What drove it? Fear. Fear and anxiety. And Paul says you don't have to live that way. He says rather than be given over to worry, he gives us a solution. He says through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let our request be made made to God. I wonder how many people would have fought on the ground for toilet paper if they, before they went shopping that day, said, God, I'm thankful that you're my provider and you're going to meet all my needs. I wonder how many of those ladies fighting on the floor prayed that prayer before they left. Not many, I would think. But that's what Paul says to do. He says, bring your concerns, your worries even about the future, bring them to God and you'll experience joy and peace. Do you believe that? I believe that. I really do. Maybe I'm naive, but I believe that. You say, John, you don't have any fears or concerns about the future, don't I? Do you know about my family? Do you know about my extended family? Do you know what's going on in America? Do you know what's going on in other parts of Australia with my family and situations they're going through? I've got causes for concerns as well. Believe me. But I'm going to, am I going to give over to anxiety and fear over it? No, I'm not prepared to do that. Because my God says I can present my needs to him, I can present my concerns to him in prayer. And if we do these things, we have God's word, God's promise that the peace of God, which transcends understanding, will guard our hearts, hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I believe it. Fourthly, Paul says, get your mind on the whatevers. Get your mind on the whatevers. What are the whatevers? Well, I think you know. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy, think about these things. Think about these things. And what a life-giving list we're given there. What a life-giving list to think on these things personally. To, to think on these things corporately. When we come together with each other, we share together corporately with what is noble and right and lovely and admirable, excellent, praiseworthy. We share that with one another. That's one of the ways that we can move beyond fear and anxiety and experience on a personal but also on a corporate level what it is to know the peace of God. Now, Paul gave us those four community traits, um, uh, getting along with each other, rejoicing in the Lord, 
um, where was I? Receiving God's peace and getting our minds on the whatevers. He gave us those four, if you like, uh, uh, characteristics of what it is to live that way. But that was only the first half of the chapter. And Paul then went on to talk about a gift he was given. And Paul was arresting, arresting here a financial gift delivered to him from the church in Philippi by a trusted brother who'd been tasked with serving Paul in prison in whatever way he needed, buying him food, clothes, etc., maybe a blanket. And Paul was writing to acknowledge the gift. And through this letter we learn the significance of living this life as a community, of being united and open-hearted in fellowship. And he begins in verse 10, and I may not read the whole account there to the end, but he said, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know it is to be in need. I know it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do this through him who gives me strength. So Paul launches into this part of the text by saying there is some important things that you need to do as a church to reveal that open-heartedness. And the first thing he, he says, uh, that there we, we, we show concern by our actions. So we'll just go to the next slide there. Just move on there through the slides. The next one. Yeah. Showing concern by our actions. You know, the church in Philippi had plenty to worry about. The Roman Empire was engaged in systematic persecution of the church. But this church in Philippi didn't allow that to stop them showing practical loving concern for Paul. So they sent him a gift. They were concerned about his imprisonment but they didn't stop at worry or anxiety. They could have said, that, oh, Paul's in prison. Oh, we're so concerned about that. God, God, we're concerned about Paul. We worry about Paul. Amen. Go home, come back next week. Oh, God, we're still worried about Paul. We're still concerned. We're anxious for his conduct. Oh, man, we hope he's got enough to eat. We hope he's got a warm blanket. Amen. Go back home, come back next week. God, we're so, so, so concerned about Paul. So worried. Oh, whatever is going to become of our poor brother. But they didn't stop there, did they? They gathered a gift. They took up an offering and they dispatched someone to go and help Paul. They showed concern by taking action. Taking action. The second thing... Uh, that happened and uh, is the, that Paul showed them was the secret of contentment, the secret of contentment. That flows into our actions as a church, learning the secret of con contentment. You know, Paul was at peace in Rome already, even though he's in prison. In verse 12 and 13, he said, I, that he had learned the secret of of contentment. He learned the secret of contentment. Um, he said, I know what is in to be in need, I know what is to have plenty, I've learned the secret of being content in each and every situation, whether well fed or hungry, or whether I'm in want. He said, I've known the secret of contentment. He'd, and he'd learned that by practical experience, by living day to day in a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I would say this, that you know, God's secrets or God's insights are available to every one of us. You know, there's not a, it's, not a, it's not an individual Christian here who says, oh, they get insights from God, they get words from God. No, God's insights are available to every believer bar none. But what it does take, folks, is sometimes we've got to spend time in a relationship with Jesus. We've got to spend time praying and time reading his word for God to open those insights into us. They don't just come, usually as we're just 
uh, going about our daily life. Usually it's a, it's a pause, a thinking, a directing our thoughts towards the Lord where we experience those insights. So Paul said, I have learnt the secret of contentment. And then in verse 13 he goes on, he writes these famous words, these famously misquoted words, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. But again, if you look at context, you can say he didn't just say those words in isolation. He, the context for I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me is Paul's contentment in his circumstances. He'd already known contentment before he flowed into it and I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Paul can talk about doing all things in Christ because he had already learned as a preface the secret of contentment. And so can we. We can learn that secret of contentment as well. And contentment is not the same as resignation. They're different things. Resignation is, well, I don't really care much what happens, I'm resigned. And people say, oh, he's contented. No, you're not. You're not contented because you're resigned. You're contented because you're at peace with the situation that you find yourself in, in God. That's a big difference, folks. It's a big difference. Anyone out there in the world can be resigned. Oh, we don't care, you know. You know, we see people live that life every day. They could, they could get a job. They could... They could get themselves into a house. They could get themselves a better car. They could get themselves a better education. They could say, no, nah, I'll just stay on benefits. I'll just be on unemployment benefits. I'm not suggesting there's anything wrong with that. But there is wrong in it if a person can get a job, has got the strength, has got the skills, has got the energy and the health to get a job, and they say, no, I will just take benefits. That is wrong. Certainly wrong from a Christian perspective. And it's a resignation saying, oh, I'll, just let the, I'll just resign myself to government support. Remember, what, don't mishear me. Even though I can do better. See the difference? I'm not shaming anybody who's on benefits. Please don't mishear me. If someone's on benefits because they, their situation that's needful and supportive, Praise God and praise God we live in a country where that's possible. But where does a person who says, I'll resign myself to government support because I can't be bothered. That's a resignation that, well, it's not good. But contentment means that where I'm at, having done all I can, I'm, I'm, I'm happy in God. I'm, I've got joy in God, you know. Whereas disconsent says, I'm not happy until I've got a car like someone else's or a house like someone else's or I'm wearing clothes like someone else's or I have a job like someone else's. That kind of discontent is not healthy. And a person who has that kind of discontent is never happy. They think they'll be contented if they get their neighbour's car, but they won't because there's another car. There's always another house. You know? Anyway. Secret of contentment. And the next thing, a joyful giving. Paul has an interesting slant on the receiving of the Philippian gift. Perhaps not what we expect. Paul is grateful for the gift, not because of how the gift will help him, not that that's unimportant, but because the gift is evidence that the Philippian church is looking beyond themselves and living a life of united and open-hearted fellowship. It's like our Thai orphanage, and I'm sure they probably do have this attitude, I'm sure I do, saying, Thank, we're thankful for the gift you've sent us because we're certainly with it we were able to buy clothes for the kids and help to build our garden up and so on. We're thankful, but we're more thankful because there's evidence that there's generosity at Vision Christian Family. That's what Paul was saying. He was saying, I'm happy for the gift. I appreciate the gift. I'll benefit from the gift. But you know what makes my heart the gladdest? 
is not the food I'll buy, but the evidence that something great is happening there in Philippi in your church. Can you see a difference? See the difference? It transforms it, doesn't it? It really does. It transforms the meaning of the gift. And Paul knows that they're sharing that gift out of their own need. And so he sees in that spiritual growth and he's glad. And then we have a second verse there that uh, is often, again, used out of context. And, and he says, And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Everyone, how many have never heard that verse before? How many have had that on their fridge at some point? I think we have. It's one of those fridge-worthy scriptures. No one ever writes, you shall suffer all things for my sake. That doesn't seem to get much exposure on the fridge. But anyway, we understand that. Paul says that God will supply all their needs according to God's riches in glory in Christ Jesus. N note here, Paul is not claiming these riches for himself. He's letting the Philippians know that because they have shown generosity to him, that God will supply their needs. That's again, that's transformational. He's not saying, I'm going to give a gift so that God will meet all my needs. He's saying, because you have given to me, God is going to do something in your lives. He's not talking about giving to get. He's not claiming those riches for himself, but so often that verse is quoted directly in regard to our own needs. But when Paul wrote this, he was not quoting it in regard to his needs. He was quoting it in regard to the needs of the church in Philippi. It's quite a difference. And is it not true that God will supply our needs? Of course it is true. God has given us that promise. But the context of, in this particular verse is Paul's confidence in God's goodness towards the Philippians. Not towards him. Towards Philippians. And I find that great. Fantastic. Paul is grateful to God that his old congregation have learned the secrets of contentment and generosity not because Paul has benefited from the gift, but because those qualities will serve the ongoing health of the church in Philippi. So it's not so much about me getting a meal, but, but you know, I can send out to Macca's now and get myself a, an Uber delivery. He was, he's not so excited about that. But he's excited about there's something going on in the church of Philippi that's going to keep going in a good way. And I know that we want to be a church like this. We want to be a church that supports one another. We want to be a church that encourages one another in however God leads. And the enemy, as always, would love to come in with disunity and keep us from God's purpose in these things. But like you, I'm always thankful, always, great, always grateful that greater is he that is in us than he is in the world. Greater is he than is us than he is in the world. And the only time we get tripped up is when we forget that. We start listening to the enemy. We start listening to the, the lies of the enemy and start believing them, particularly about one another. That's when he does his greatest work. But we don't want to be like that, and I don't think we are like that. So let's pray. Let's pray in this church for a pervading spirit of united and open-hearted fellowship together. You think that's a good prayer? You think it's a prayer that God would love to honour and answer? I think so. Let's stand together. And uh, let's invite God by his spirit to make of us a people who communicate to each other and to this world the love of character of God. Because the world's watching. Don't worry about that. The world is watching us. Let's pray that they see something that's worth seeing. Father God, we thank you for this journey through Philippians. Lord, you've, you've taught us so much. You've shown us so much. And Lord, we, we, it's beyond us to take it all in. But Lord, bit by bit, we pray you drop the, the, the nuggets of truth, the, 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 the things that you've scattered over this time 
in our hearts when we need it for that season of need and we'd be able to respond to you in faith and love to express whatever it is you remind us of. Lord, help us to be a church that is united and open-hearted in generosity. United with one another in vision and purpose and open-hearted in our generosity to one another and to those who lie outside these four walls. For Lord, you want us to be both an expression of love to our community here and to the community of Ipswich and beyond, even to Thailand and India. And Lord, we thank you for the opportunities you've given us in those areas. So Lord, take our hearts and mould them how you want them to be. Lord, we're all a work in progress. Lord, none of us should sit here today ashamed because we're not where we think we should be. But Lord, help us to realise that every one of us, from this pastor to these elders, we are all works in progress. You haven't finished with any of us yet. And we pray, Lord, don't finish with us. Don't finish with us. Keep working, keep moulding, keep building in us something that makes your heart glad and brings glory to your name. We ask this in your precious name, the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 God bless you.